Actually. So with Ex Machina then, your, uh, who's your financial person? Uh, so you told me the name, I can't remember. Yeah, Michel Belmache. Yeah. Michel, okay. Michel, yeah. And you have a board as well. Yeah. And the reason I ask again is because when young artists and students watch these interviews, I want them to understand the structure that you realized you had to have in order to have creative freedom. Yeah. Uh, and your board, you choose them, are they, are they business people or how, how's the relationship of you and, and the board? Well, th th there's political people a lot. There's uh, business people, um, advisors, uh, legal advisors, lots sort of other people. But um, something that, that you have to understand also about how we structure the company is that um, very early on, the freedom we wanted, we knew we could achieve if we, if we didn't get money from another, uh, another channel besides all the international co-production. So, for example, I naively thought that if Ex Machina co-produced with film companies, for example, if I did cinema, there's a lot of money in cinema compared to theater, so that money would be re-injected and doing productions. But of course, it never happened. Um, I, I never enjoyed my, my, in my years as a filmmaker, I never enjoyed doing film. It wasn't my, wasn't my place. You, didn't, wasn't, you didn't enjoy the confessional in it? Wow. Bought the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> sold it on eBay, you know? So I, I just don't want to do that anymore. I mean, it was, yeah, it was great. I learned a lot. I enjoyed doing it, but I mean, I didn't... It, it wasn't my call. It wasn't my thing. So, fine. And not only that, financially, it never, never... Uh, it never uh, over... Uh, the, the, the money never never ended up in, in, in the theater department. Right? So, uh, the next best thing was opera. I had been doing opera for a lot of money in opera, maybe not in Canada, but certainly in Europe there's a lot of it, in Japan, and it is very close to theater, and found that it was a, a closer kin to what I was doing in the theater, even though it is, right. you know, repertoire, it's all that, but still, that there was a lot of freedom in opera, the opera world is extremely creative, uh, it's very misunderstood, I think, but there's a, a lot of very brave, courageous performers, directors, Designers, designers. So, yeah. uh, so there's a lot of stuff to be done there, and the big uh, opera companies are in a strange place right now because even though they have a lot of money to do what they usually do, they they know the the craft is is it's not dying but it's fading away because they have problems renewing the audiences, the and the inner house systems and the unions and all that is kind of keeping things still. So, what we offer is that we say, well, let X Machina we take all of the budget, we bring it to Quebec City, we devise the whole thing there where you're going to get much more for your money and then we're going to bring it back. And so that way we've managed to, to, to work with much bigger budgets, have it bounce a bit more on the theater side. So and was that your idea? Eventually, yeah. Eventually, there's a moment where I said, well, why am I doing opera on one side and then working with my company? I have to, my company has to do opera. So now there's a department with right. Ex Machina that only deals with opera. So you, so if I in, can encapsulate what you're saying, you, the creative side of you that wants to create, mm -hmm. to see, is very ably uh, accompanied by um, a caretaker side, mm -hmm. who says, well, if you want to create, you have to have a structure, because yeah. you can't do it there. Yeah. And you, you've carried both, as it were, you've taken care of yourself or guarded your creativity. Well, I'll tell you something. There's something about um, what painters uh, <coughs> allow themselves to do. And if you're a painter, you, you have a workshop and you are not in somebody's season. You are not programmed anywhere. People expect you to produce and eventually do a show, but you know you don't have a date. You don't have necessarily a budget. You have a workshop in which you explore and do your things, and eventually something comes out of that. And there's all these other things that, that, that stay there in the workshop that will probably trigger some other work one day, whatever. And then you show what it is you've done and you sell it or whatever. Um, we never do that in the theater. And, and very early on, I felt that I had too many things I wanted to touch on to, too many things I wanted to explore that. I, I felt too limited and squeezed in a, in a, a usual production that I needed to. You know, kind of. So I touch on many things. So the caserne, the, 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 the fire hall that we we have in Quebec City is kind of a, an incubator of all these ideas. And it's like a huge place where we spend the day 
doing a bit of this, a bit of that, and eventually all these things inform each other. So we don't do opera and then we do plays and then we do special events. All of that is the same people anyways, it's right. the same vocabulary, uh, people being end up being hired on other projects and some of the ideas in one project that didn't find its way end up in an opera. So it's like a huge workshop, it's like a cosmos. You create your own little cosmos, it's one little thing. And stuff, planets come out of there once in a while. That's, that's and the designers, do you work, like the Michael Levines who aren't part of it, but you work with them, but you have some in-house, not in-house, but ex but they're fateful collaborators, right. that's for sure. Yeah, and sometimes it's too much, sometimes they have too much work, they've been on too many, so we say, okay, fine, we'll, we, we, we try to bring in new blood and new people, but, it, but we, become, we, we start training people now, or, or, or uh, we have a lot of, call them interns or yeah, yeah, yeah. we have people who come in as observers and they end up working on the shows as assistants and they, uh, you know, they end up performing in them or whatever so there's a huge huge demand for people to come and observe our work there's a lot of people doing PhDs about us and all that and I don't want to sound pretentious but there's no, no, no. Well, you've so, created an alternate model to the commercial model which is doing yeah. that to us yeah. and you've created a model that's mm -hmm. done that so we're rightfully fascinated. How did you make it work? Give me an example, say, with Michael Levine, uh, who, who isn't who you know, who you work. Yeah. How would you and Michael start to talk about a project in well, terms of design? Yeah, well, actually, we haven't worked together in a little while, but we, we, uh, when we did work together, um, M Michael's uh, process is very close to that of a painter uh, in the sense that he, he doesn't think theater. So I always think practical theater why do the people come in, how, why is the audience going to be, all that. Uh, he, he's very much of an art gallery guy. He, 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 likes, he, he likes creating art gallery uh, impressions so that when you see a Michael Levine set, it's a work of art in itself. That's it's another layer of, of, of and, and I remember when I saw the, the extraordinary work he did on the ring here in, in, in Toronto. First Canadian ring that he designed, for the, and, and you could have taken the singers out and taken everything out and just look at the four sets, and they're like uh, four extraordinary sculptures uh, of, of his. So I, I never have the impression that I'm working with a stage designer. I have the impression I'm working with uh, a sculptor, a painter, uh, a designer. Uh, costume designer, but not just costume, uh, for, uh, fashion design. But say, uh, Michael, and you were going to work on an, on an opera, mm -hmm. would you listen to the score first? Would yeah. you read the libretto? What would, what would be we the first step? We listen to the score. We listen to, we, we, we listen to the, the music a lot. And um, Michael is a good director. He has very strong directorial ideas. And I think um, when we worked together, I remember when we did Mr. Night Stream in London, um, I don't remember sitting around model sets or drawings that much. I remember talking, having a lot of directorial ideas coming from Michael. If he had been the director, he would have done that. What, in the kind of world that we should see? Or, you know, what would be the forest? What would be the court? I those kind of ideas? What, what the piece is about. Also knowing what the piece, sometimes better than a director, what the piece is about, what this character is about. And, and, uh, and I think he did an amazing job as a director when, when he did the first increment of the ring. Uh, so as a director, and I'm a designer, I'm a frustrated designer, so I'm supposed to be the one who speaks like he speaks, but I actually go, yeah, but I had this idea. That, so I, I, it was a good exchange because we, we're, we're, we allow each other to walk on each other's turf. And do you think, when you think of design, either for yourself or with Michael, do you think texture? Do you think color? Do you think structure? Do you think... Uh, plastic, what, uh, you know, a plasticism to it, what, how do your images work? Well, I think that um, I have this, this thing that I've learned with time, uh, and it's, it's the exact theme of, of, of time, time in the theater. Uh, the meetings with Michael are about space, but the space you design for the theater is, it only works if it's intimately connected to time. And what is time? And time in, in in the theater uh, is something that uh, in French would say se dilate, dilates itself. The meaning that it's not something you can 
sees, well, if you're going to do a nine-hour show, there's a moment where the time becomes something that's irrelevant. It's not either long or short or time becomes, it's, you're in a different place, you're in yep. a different place. So the designer, the, 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 the set designer uh, suggests how to structure space, but that's completely irrelevant, but it's not going to continue the idea of time. And the way to connect that is to say, well, how does this evolve with time? Through the show, you mean? How does it show, move how, through time? How, how does it move? How does it evolve? How does it... Because there's this theory that um, in the theater, every 40 seconds, the audience is expecting a different thing. It's expecting to go to another tableau. It doesn't mean another scene, but it means he suddenly has to see the thing through another facet or differently. Because perhaps. of television and film, you mean? I don't know. It seems to be a 40 second... <laughs> For a second system, so I mean I don't follow that by the book. What I'm saying, it just informs me that you can't sit there for four hours at Siegfried and look at the same image for four hours. You, there is something about the music, which is a representation representation of time and the space that have to the space has to move with the time that is suggested by the music. So in the theater, it's the same thing. I think there is something about. Uh, space is, is has to be reinvented a lot of times so it doesn't mean changing set or the set all the time but it means offering the audience an opportunity to walk through what it is that you're presenting the only way you could give them that system that sensation is if you if you move the thing around a bit or if you, you whether it's the change of texture of light or, or movement or how things are blocked how things are uh, so, hmm. so it's it's a it's a it's a celebration of time that meets space. 